All right, good to see everybody again today. Welcome to those of you joining us online. So today we start out in this last phase of this letter that Paul writes to the church in Ephesus. I know some of you are like, man, we've been in Ephesians forever. It's like, yeah, it's been a while. But we're in that final leg, that final stretch. Um, And it's really important because it focuses now on individual behavior. So from now until the end, we're going to be focused on individual behavior. And if you think about this letter that Paul writes, there's six chapters, as you all know, the first three are about belief. And belief is so important because you got to know what it is that you believe. Everything starts with knowledge, if you think about that. For example, you got to know that it is that we are saved by grace through faith before we can even begin to start believing that that is the truth in our lives. And then in chapters four through six, as we shift into behavior, what we've been studying really since Christmas or so has been this behavior of the church. So that's where Paul starts. He starts out by showing us how the church is to behave in light of what it is that we believe. And that's important because we all learn that God's master plan set in place before the foundation of the world is to unite all things in Christ. And he does that through the church. And that's why it's so important that we're actively engaged as a church. That's why Cammie mentioned the covenant partner classes. I'd encourage you, if you are not a covenant partner, come check them out. Great way to learn about how you can be part of God's master plan. And that is so that we maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And those are Paul's words that he uses to describe how this all goes down, how the Holy Spirit has the role of uniting us, and we are called as a church to maintain that unity. And that's really what we've been studying since January. And then today, and for the next however long it takes us, I wish I could tell you a time, but who knows, um, Paul's going to show us how we're to behave individually so that we can attain to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And of course, we're going to keep reaching back to how the church is going to behave and how we keep reaching back to our belief section, because as we've learned, belief and behavior, they're intrinsically linked. You cannot separate the two of them. If you really want to know what it is that people believe, just check out their behavior. We say all kinds of things. We're always telling people what it is that we believe. But if you really want to know, just look at the behavior. So as we dig into this section, I think we're going to be impressed by a couple of things. I've been studying this over the last month in preparation for these four sermons or so here. One thing I've been impressed with has been the details that Paul goes into here. It's remarkable how specific he is in the minute details of our behavior. And it appears that he does this because he wants us to see how this truth applies to all aspects of our lives. Because if you think about it, it's the only way for us to start engaging in consistent living. And by that I mean so that we behave the same way in our everyday ordinary lives as we might behave on a Sunday when we come to church. And so the approach Paul takes from now until the end of this letter is to get into those details, drawing specific connections between what we believe and then how we are to behave. As Martin Lloyd-Jones writes, our conduct should be inevitable in view of what we believe. So if you wrestle with behavior in your life that you don't think is in step with Christianity, the key takeaway here is not to focus on your behavior but focus on what it is that you believe. And as an aside here, if you think about it from a parental perspective, we're always focused on how our kids behave and we tend to address the behavior of the kids. But in actuality, if we would focus a bit more on the belief, we might actually find the behavior changes a little bit more permanently and hopefully a little more quickly. So Paul starts this new section out with these words. Now this I say and testify in the Lord. As we've seen in the past, this is one of those phrases where you're apt to just read right over it, right? What does that mean? Now this I say and testify in the Lord. But if we do that, we're going to miss some really important stuff here. The word now used this way is actually a transition. It is a therefore of sorts. It links us to the previous part. In other words, now that we know how the church is to behave, Paul is now going to teach us how we're supposed to individually behave. So the now is the big transition from church behavior to individual behavior. And Paul's not only going to say it, 
but he's also going to testify about it. Now, testify means to exhort solemnly or to evoke a witness. And of course, witnesses are called forth to tell the truth. So Paul's use of this word testify suggests he doesn't want us to think that he's giving us his opinion here. No, he's speaking or writing solemnly or with all seriousness because he's testifying to truth as a witness. And he's witnessing as one who is in the Lord or in communion with Jesus. So this isn't one of those as God is my witness remarks. We hear that all the time in our everyday ordinary lives, as God is my witness. That's not what's going on here because Paul is the witness. He is the one testifying and he's testifying to a matter of grave importance because of the source from which Paul received it. Remember Paul's teaching with the full authority of an apostle, someone who knows Jesus personally. So these are words he's about to share with us that come from the full authority of Jesus. They are truth, and Paul wants us to know that. So now let's turn to the truth that Paul testifies to here, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. Now, we don't often put things in the negative like that in this day and age, but they do tend to give us a real sense of clarity, don't they? In other words, don't walk as those Gentiles do. Now, at the time, the saints in Ephesus, they would clearly have known what was meant by this phrase. It would be kind of like me saying today, don't behave like those obnoxious Browns fans. <laughs> you, you all automatically know exactly what I'm talking about. Mouth breathers, foul-tempered, tacky. Who wears orange and brown together, right? <laughs> so Paul's essentially saying, you all know what I mean here. Don't be like that. Don't walk as the Gentiles do. So the action that Paul is focused on here is walking. And the word for walk in the Greek means to live or to conduct oneself. So this means how we conduct ourselves in the entirety of our lives. In other words, we need to consider absolutely everything, what's on the inside of us, our belief, and what's on the outside of us, our behavior. It's why Paul's always linking belief to behavior, and it's so important that we get this. How what we believe on the inside shapes how we behave on the outside. And so we must make really sure that we don't do any of it anymore. Don't believe or behave like those Gentiles or like those nasty, dreadful, nauseating Browns fans. And of course, this had to hit them personally because they've clearly behaved this way in the past. And how do we know that? Well, because of the phrase, no longer, which also means hereafter. So from this point forward, there will be no more of that Gentile belief or Gentile behavior. Why? Because there's been a radical shift in their life. Same goes for you and me if we've been born again. If we have placed our faith in Jesus, our belief is now in Him, and therefore we have His Holy Spirit in us. And so our behavior must now change too, and it's a permanent change, it's a hereafter. We can't return to the old ways because we've been born again. And that's why it's so important that we're fully cognizant, fully aware of where it is that we've come from. We've all been on that wide dark path up there, dead in our trespasses and sins, headed for eternal destruction. That is the life of a Gentile at the time. They were outside of the Jewish faith with no belief in God. But of course, God sent his son to save his adopted children, which we now know included the Gentiles. And of course, the church in Ephesus had many former Gentiles who had placed their faith in Jesus. So they were no longer Gentiles. They were Christians. Their new identity was in Christ. The same went for the Jews who'd placed their faith in Jesus. They were no longer Jewish. They were Christians. And so Christians were to stop living like those non-believing Gentiles had done in the past. And Paul then characterizes this life succinctly. They lived in the futility of their minds. And this is such an important phrase for us to understand. In fact, we're going to have to unpack the rest of what Cammie read for us next week because we're going to focus the rest of our time here on this phrase, the futility of their minds. 
So what did he mean here? Well, let's start with the object, the mind. This is not just intellectual. The word used for mind here is nous. And in this case, it means reason, thoughts, feelings, desires, the will, and our soul. So this is the totality of our inner being, all that comes together within us to establish and profess a belief. And Paul describes their minds or the totality of their inner being as feudal. What a word, feudal. That's matiedos in the original Greek, and it means devoid of truth, inappropriate, perverse, empty, depraved. What a picture. The unregenerate, unbelieving Gentiles were devoid of truth. Can you imagine living your life devoid of truth? And of course, we know that truth can only be found in the person, words, and works of Jesus, as is contained in Scripture. So the pagans, the unbelieving Gentiles, they didn't know Jesus. Their minds were focused on inappropriate, perverse things. It's why they were empty at their core, never satisfied, because they had no truth to anchor them. They were depraved. Now, we saw that word before when we studied the Sermon on the Mount, and we looked specifically at the doctrine of total depravity, where as a result of sin, every part of man has been corrupted, deceitful, desperately wicked, according to Jeremiah. Man is at enmity with God. Our righteous acts are even like filthy rags before a holy God, as Isaiah writes. That is our true condition. And we must be careful to not see this as only a fitting description of the unbelieving Gentile, because these characteristics aren't a result of their ethnicity as Gentiles. Rather, it's because of their unbelief. And we know this because there were many Gentiles who placed their faith in Jesus and they were born again. So they took up their crosses daily and they followed after him. So the description, feudal minds, is actually a result of unbelief in Christ, not from being born a Gentile. We can also see this by just looking around us in our day and age. Our world is full of unbelievers, people with feudal minds, those who are squarely on that wide, dark path up there that leads to eternal destruction because they lack the truth of Jesus. They have feudal, empty, perverse, devoid of truth, and depraved minds. And so they're given over to every inappropriate and perverse fascination. It's what explains in part indiscriminate school shootings, drug and pornography addictions, gender identity, and the overall apathy that plagues our culture this day. It's all a result of feudal minds. And we've clearly struggled for centuries to grasp what Paul's teaching here, because just look at how so many of us typically respond to these heinous behaviors. What do we do first? Well, we condemn them, don't we? We stand there, and we sit in judgment, and we condemn them. And then what do we do? We look for someone to blame. Got to blame the parents. Got to blame the guns. Got to blame the bullies. And then we try to treat the symptoms. And how do we do that? With pharmaceuticals, endless therapy, and social programs. But we have 2,000 years of history since Paul wrote this to prove to us that that approach just does not work. You see, you can't have morality without godliness. We've been trying that for years. Paul saw it when he visited Athens. There were philosophers and unknown gods everywhere. And that whole point was espousing all of this morality that Athens was supposed to have. And yet Athens was riddled with heinous behavior and idolatry, just like our culture today. And of course, we've seen it here in America in a profound way, especially in the past few decades, when we stopped acknowledging God in the public sector, in our families, in our everyday ordinary lives, things have gone sideways in short order. Now you see, to fix these problems, Paul teaches that you got to treat the cause, not the symptoms, not the gender or sexual confusion, but the feudal mind that lies behind it. The answer is found in the truth of Scripture. It's not found in education. It's not found in the arts. It's not found in the sciences. It's found in the person, words, and works of Christ. Paul, 
who speaks on the authority of Jesus himself, he tells us the cause. It has to do with our belief. Because as he keeps showing us, beliefs shape our behaviors. So to change behavior, we must change belief. And of course, belief unfolds in the totality of our inner being, at the noose. And without a belief in the truth, as found in Scripture, our lives are futile because they're devoid of truth. So to address the significant confusion of our times, the answer is simple. It's belief in Jesus. Now, this sounds a little bit like something a pastor might say, doesn't it? It's like, it's your line of work. This is your business. You're just drumming up business here. But here's the thing. I'm not saying that. Paul is. And he's testifying to it on the basis of divine authority. So it's truth. The only way to address a futile mind is by being born again into a new life in Christ. So what does being born again really mean? I mentioned it a little bit ago, and what we're going to find is that the next three or four weeks, we're really going to dig into this at a deep level. But it essentially means that you get to start over in life, kind of like an infant does. And it happens when you repent, when you turn from your old ways and turn to the new ones, when you place your faith in Jesus. In that moment, you are justified or made right before God by Christ's blood shed on the cross. You receive his Holy Spirit who sanctifies you, convicting, counseling, comforting you in the truth of Scripture so that you're no longer tossed to and fro by the waves or blown about by every wind of doctrine so that you grow in maturity to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So what Paul is essentially teaching us here is that when you're on that well-lighted, narrow path, not only do you need to grow up, like we learned last week, but you also got to start behaving in step with what it is you believe. You cannot continue to behave the way you did before. There's a firewall of sorts. It's just not possible because you've been born again. You have a new life in Christ, and your new set of beliefs overpowers the futility of your mind the totality of your inner being, so that any attempts at going back to your old waves leave you feeling even more hopeless than you did before when you were on that wide, dark path. Remember how you could never, ever really find true satisfaction when you were there. Well, not only that, but you also start to find the things in the old life start to become unsettling to you. And the further you progress down that well-lighted, narrow path, it goes from unsettling to simply repulsive. You cannot go back. You simply must put it off because you've died to it. You repented. You turn from that dark path and you turn to the well-lighted one. And what Paul is teaching us here is that we cannot keep a foot in both worlds. It's just not possible. So how does this play out in our lives in a practical sense? Well, you see the typical day up there on the screen, right? We can work our way through that day with a futile mind, and so many people do, where there's no meaning or true satisfaction in any of it. It's just going through life, going through the motions. Or we can live out that very same day guided by the spirit of truth that lives within us when we place our faith in Jesus, when we're born again. Let me tell you, it changes absolutely everything. We start living a meaningful life, or as Paul puts it in this letter he writes to the church in Galatia, and this is a paraphrase from Peterson, but what happens when we live God's way? He brings gifts into our lives, much the same way that fruit appears in an orchard. Things like affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity. We develop a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart, and a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. Can you imagine living tomorrow like that, or the rest of your everyday ordinary life like that? 
But that's what happens to our lives when our belief is placed in the truth of the person, words, and works of Jesus. I mean, true belief, not just something you say, but belief that causes your behavior to change so that your belief and your behavior are aligned. And that's why we keep encouraging everyone to train up on these pillars so we can put them into practice in our everyday ordinary lives as we live out the twin towers of our calling, the great commandments to love God and to love others, and the great commission to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It gives us a whole new outlook on life, one that is radiant with hope because it's in step with God's will, the way he designed us and part of our calling to a new life in Christ. Never looking back, fixing our eyes on our Lord and Savior, always looking to the Son. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word today. We pray that you might draw us deeper into dependence on you so that we never look back, always growing in our relationship with Jesus. May you always be the source of our strength, the substance of our work, and the object of all of our endeavors. For Jesus' sake, amen. So for our response time today, we're going to put a timer up here and a couple of questions for you to contemplate, meditate, pray a little bit about. But in particular, that first question, it is absolutely so important for us to wrestle with this. And like I said, over the next few weeks, we're going to continue to unpack to a greater extent, as Paul teaches us, what it really means to be born again.